So I, I need to jump in this morning. I, I think what we're going to do this month, actually for the month of July, I'm going to be gone one Sunday, but we're going to settle in uh, on a study that I think is really important for us, uh, critical probably for, for every Christian. And the reason is every Christian needs to know how to develop a strong faith. Um, and so just kind of saying that, I'm going to we're, we're traveling today. This is my goodbye. We're going to drive on off into the, the sunrise. Uh, and so I'll be gone next week, and Jeremy King is going to bring the, the lesson next week. But when I get back, we're going to finish up this, this three-week study by the end of July. So to start, just works out. It's Independence Day. I am, I am what is this, a rocket pop, I think, is what I'm dressed like here. It's kind of cool. Um, ready to go. Um, Independence Day is pretty great, right? We, we celebrate it as a nation. We celebrate by eating off of a grill and blowing things up. I think that's kind of interesting. And so I would just say to all of you, be safe. But with that in mind, I was thinking as Christians, we have been set free. But think, we've been set free from independence. It was that moral free agency that led to all our doom. It was going our own way, doing our own thing that led to our ultimate destruction. And God loved us so much. That through Jesus Christ, he freed us from that freedom so that no longer are we slaves to sin, but slaves to righteousness. And we celebrate that too. And like we just did, we have a, a meal at the Lord's Supper. And we try not to blow things up as we walk by the Spirit in this life. And so something I find to be true in this life, kind of just true at all levels, is that if you want to build strength in anything, if you want to build strength it's going gonna, it's gonna to take some working things out. I, I don't know if you've thought about that, but just kind of all the way around, that principle is true. Physically, you never really get to that age where you're like, you know what, I'm just getting better by doing nothing. I mean, you never get to a place where you don't need to do a little bit of working things out or there's going to be some consequences to that. And the truth is, spiritually, it's the same. We never reach a place spiritually where we can stop exercising our faith because we need strong faith. And when faith comes without trials, without tests, without struggle, it's just, it's a simple faith. But simple faith is not going to sustain you when the real tough times come in life. I mean, just think about this. Life is going to test you. And if I look at the people in my life who have most impacted my faith and strengthened my faith, those are not the people that had life just go easy for them. In fact, think about it, they're usually the people that have been the most tested, the most tried, gone through the most struggles, and yet through all of it just decided, nope, it's God no matter what. And so we don't need an easy or simple faith because that's never going to hold us up when life gets difficult. We need a tough and a rugged faith to help us get through those times when our faith is truly tested. Now, again, those people who didn't have it easy developed a tough faith through tough times. And there's a lesson there for us, and I want to pick up on that this month, to, to seek for all of us to develop that rugged faith that will really uphold us when the rugged road of life gets tough. Now, I think, especially after the season we've all been through, it would be good for us to spend a little time talking about our faith, especially when times have been tough. And there's a perfect place in Scripture to go in this. In fact, I know you're already way ahead of me. Of course, I, I kind of blew the lead. It's right there. I mean, all of you were thinking, tough faith. Hey, let's go to Habakkuk, right? Uh, earlier this week, I thought, if I had a dollar for every time I'd preached a series on Habakkuk, I wouldn't have a dollar yet. Um, <laughs> but, but if after this series, all of you gave me a dollar, that would be really cool. So just think about that. Um, Habakkuk actually turns out to be this great place, like right, right there in these minor prophets, which simply means they had very little to write, and he had very little to write, just three chapters. Right between Nahum, which of course I'm sure you're reading every day, uh, and Zephaniah as well, sits Habakkuk, this disgruntled and discouraged prophet. Now, why I think Habakkuk is the perfect place to go for our current season is because unlike all the rest of the prophets, Habakkuk is not complaining or talking to the people. Now, don't get me wrong, the people were horrible. They had sinned against God. They, they, they were wrong in their actions. They needed to be judged. They needed to return to God. But Habakkuk's biggest complaint was not the people, it was God. 
Why are you letting this go on? Why don't you do something about it? He was, he was annoyed that as chaos surrounded him, God sat by and did nothing. He was looking at a country that he loved. And he just wondered why God could let it be destroyed. And so the book of Habakkuk starts here. In fact, if you want to read through me, and it would be a great idea in this month, just kind of take Habakkuk. It's a quick read. Go through it. Get familiar with it. It's a very personal prophecy. But he begins by saying the oracle that Habakkuk the prophet received, How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. I got to tell you, I just read the beginning of that and there is no problem identifying personally to what's going on with Habakkuk. But instead of going there first, let's, let's start with some context. So you, you have the Exodus story. And if you're looking at the Exodus story, what it is, is it's God saving a family. It was the family of the Hebrews. And that family that he delivers from slavery in Egypt, he promises a land and a nation that, that they would be great. Twelve tribes living as one nation. And for hundreds of years, that nation exists as Israel. But having gone through prophets and judge leadership, they finally think we want a king like everyone else. And sadly, in that nation's history, just David after Saul and Solomon live under a unified kingdom. But after the death of Solomon, the nation splits with 10 tribes forming the northern kingdom of Israel and two tribes forming the southern kingdom of Judah. And as we studied in our last series on unity, when that division of a nation happened, spiritual decline followed. Idolatry apostasy, injustice. And the truth is, it just fell apart a little faster in Israel. And so God sent Assyria and he punished Israel through those people and he took them away from their home and really erased them from world history. Now, think about this. Habakkuk was born after those things. And as a prophet in the southern kingdom, he's looking at the nation he's loved. He's looking at the people of God that he loves, and he thinks the same things are happening now that cause the destruction of that northern kingdom. Everywhere I look, he says, wickedness, cruelty, and injustice. And he knows that if this continues, it's going to ruin this nation. And so he starts to wonder, why, God? Why have you not stepped in and stopped them? And this is where his faith is going to go through some tough times. Now understand, the existence of evil or wickedness in this world has always been a tough problem for faith. In fact, how many of you have heard somebody say something like, you know, I, I just don't know that I believe in the existence of a benevolent and divine God because there's just too much evil and injustice and wickedness in this world. Now, now here's a tough lesson about strong faith. I think all the wickedness, all the evil in this world is one of the main reasons I do believe in God. And I'll tell you why. There is no legitimate complaint against evil in this world if there is not, above all, a morally excellent eternal God, a standard for good and evil. If there is no God, why do you complain about evil? What's your expectation for good? In fact, I thought this was interesting. Richard Dawkins, an atheist author, writes in River Out of Eden, a Darwinian view of life. A very honest truth. Writing about suffering and evil in, the life, in our life as being random and unjust, uh, he goes on to claim, this should be expected in a universe that has no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. Now that is truly depressing, and I, I don't want to live my life under that theory. Not a lot of inspiration there, but think about it. If there's no great designer, no moral standard behind everything, if this is just merely a material universe, a great accident of the cosmos, we should expect cruelty, unfairness, and randomness as our life. But what I love about Habakkuk is as bad as things get, he doesn't take that view. He doesn't see the universe that way. In fact, he's confident in the existence of God, and he's absolutely aware of God's character. But that's what's causing his faith to hit tough times. I want you to notice in Habakkuk 1, go verses 12 through 13. 
He says, O Lord, are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, we will not die. O Lord, you have appointed them to execute judgment. O Rock, you have ordained them to punish. Your eyes are too pure to look at evil. And, and this is where the tension starts to get ratcheted up. He says, you cannot tolerate wrong. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? Listen, Habakkuk is saying, God, I know who you are. You are everlasting. You are my God. You are holy. You are invincible. You are my judge. You are the rock. So why aren't you doing anything? And this is the question for us in this series. What do we do when it feels like our rock that we stand on is now on top of us? And so here's our motto, and we'll bring this up each part of this series. We need to develop a tough faith that will support us when the rock allows us to go through tough times. And I think we ought to just start saying out loud that this is where a lot of us have been in the last 15 months. We have been in a tough spot. We have been tested. The road has been rugged. Most of us have experienced things these past 15 months that a simple faith just won't support. In fact, I was thinking about the story of my life and faith. Uh, as a young person, uh, simple faith was enough. In fact, looking back, I can't think of an event or events that really ever tested or challenged my faith in God. It just all came really simple. I believe in God. It's all working out pretty well. And then at 20, <laughs> all that changed. I think I'd only been to maybe a couple of funerals in my entire life to that point. And there I was attending the funeral of my best friend's wife. They'd been married less than two years. They had a daughter less than one year old. And out of nowhere, his wife, less than 24 years old, was murdered. And, and that was just a serious smashing of a simple faith. And I will tell you, showing up, simple faith had nothing to say in that situation. And it has seemed to me that that one testing has led to many other great testings in my life for a tougher faith during tough times. You know, that simple faith, the childhood just had to go away. It had to get stronger. And so more than 20 years after that, just three years ago, I found myself at my best friend's funeral. <laughs> Unexpected, unwanted, absolutely unjust. And I asked what Habakkuk asked, why? Why, God, are you allowing this? Why do you let this happen? Why are you standing by and this is what we're living through? And once again, these moments that rock us are going to totally destroy us if we're counting on a simple faith to get us through. We need a strong faith in confusing times. And so I asked you last Wednesday, and I want you to take some time today. This will be up here for another week. As you think about the last 15 months and where you've been, I'd like you to think about the things you've lost during that time. And just write them down. I've got little cards up here. In fact, it's been encouraging already to read through some of them. But this is the beginning of exercising our faith until it becomes a tough enough faith to sustain us. Because God knows our faith must be stronger. We need a faith that will lift us up when life has taken us under. And so God told Habakkuk something repeated throughout Scripture because it's so important. It's so foundational. He says to Habakkuk, the righteous will live by his faith. We need a faith we can hold on to when life shakes us to our core. We, we need a faith that will help us withstand when tough times arise. And so as God has told us, the righteous will live by faith. Now, to truly live, we need a loyal and steady belief in God. We need a faith that has been tested. And so here's what I want to do in this series. I want to show you how to do that. How do we get through this process of testing? What does it look like? And so when I get back in two weeks, we'll look at uh, another lesson in Habakkuk, and that is what a delayed faith looks like. What, what happens when the God you know has an answer and you believe he will answer you just doesn't seem to be any hurry to give you that answer? How long? is what Habakkuk says, and, and you'll find yourself in that place. And then we'll finish at the end of this month 
with a faith that, that sounds a little bit like no matter what. You see, will we finally get to a strengthening of our faith, a place where we find comfort in the rock, even if he allows us to be rocked in this life? But now, today, we're going to take on the hardest one. <laughs> we're going to start with a confused faith, and that is the faith that just asks God, why? Why are things in this life like they are when I know who you are and what you're like? This is where the confusion comes from. You see, the confusion develops over how things are and who God is, and they just don't seem to fit together. And so again, Habakkuk 1 at 13, why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? Verses 3 and 4, why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? The confusion in our faith comes from trying to understand and grasp the holiness of our God who is reigning on high and the ugliness of the reality of this life. So listen, our why will ultimately be answered by our who. See, we question God based on our understanding of the character of God. And so here's the thought from Habakkuk. Just what kind of rock do you think God is? What kind of rock do you believe him to be? There are so many people who have a simple faith that hit hard times and God is the very first thing to go. Because of the weakness of who their who is, they never quite understand why. And so there are many who conclude, well, God is good, but he's not great. Because if he was great, he would never allow me to go through this. See, there's a couple of assumptions going on there. The, the, the first is that they assume that a great God would make sure that they never have anything bad happen to them. Which makes another assumption, and that is that a great God couldn't somehow redeem our suffering to his glory and for our benefit. The other end of that spectrum is our God, or God's, as some would see it. They're great. They're just not good. And that's how a lot of people get through just explaining how bad life can be. Listen, we're going to figure out our why based on who we believe our rock is. And, and, and this letter is so great because Habakkuk would not have wasted his words or the ink asking why if he'd been a polytheist. He would have just figured, well, my current God's not good enough, and so I'll find one out there somewhere. I mean, why, why bother to ask why? I just am... I haven't found the right God yet. And, and Habakkuk would not have asked why if he were a deist. You know, God's just too far removed and too far above to get involved in our reality here. And, and so that's just, uh, you know, what you get here in life is tough times. And Habakkuk would not have bothered asking why if he had been an intellectually honest atheist. Well, there is no God, so why ask why? Life is suffering. Life is random. It's just what this material universe looks like. But Habakkuk asked God why, because Habakkuk knew who God was. Listen, there was no question in his mind. He had, he had said Shema prayer his entire life. The Lord our God, O Israel, is one. He is one God. He knew. Our God is good. Our God is great. Our God is holy. And, and he can't do anything evil. He is reigning on the throne. He is in charge of all things. And for most of us, we stand right there with Habakkuk. And let me just tell you, if you believe those things about God, that's where you're going to get some confusion in your faith. Why is the world the way it is if you believe God is who he is? And we'll wrestle with our understanding of God and all those things we just don't understand. Why? Now, I would just say this. I would say the same to my kids. Be careful about asking why. Because you don't always like the answer you get when you question God. But why are you letting injustice and wickedness destroy Judah like you did Israel? Habakkuk asks. And the truth is, God gives an answer. And so the first part of this is confused faith has a very clear picture about who God is. Here's Habakkuk 1, verses 3 through 6. 
Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. Look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed for I'm going to do something in your days that you would not believe. Even if I were to tell you, I am rising up the Babylonians, the ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwelling places, not their own. All right, now that's quite an answer. God's answer to Habakkuk is, oh, I do see and it's really bad. And so I've sounds, I found some worse people that I'm going to bring in to judge what's going on here in this land. Now, I just want you to think about this. How often are we just desperate to hear from God? And then you hear him, but you don't like what he has to say. This is exactly what's going on for Habakkuk here. You see, Habakkuk pivots pretty quickly from, why won't you do something? Then he hears and says, what on earth are you doing? Look a little bit further, verses 12 through 17. He says, oh Lord, are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, we will not die. Oh Lord, we've appointed them to execute judgment. Oh rock, you have ordained them to punish. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrong. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? You've made men like fish in the sea, like sea creatures that have no ruler. The wicked foe pulls all of them up with the hooks. He catches them in his net. He gathers them up in his dragnet. And so he rejoices and is glad. Therefore, he sacrifices to his net and burns incense to his dragnet. For by his net, he lives in luxury and enjoys the choicest food. Is he to keep on emptying his net, destroying nations without mercy? Just think about Habakkuk's response. Why would you use people that bad to punish Judah? They're way worse than us. In essence, Habakkuk moves from, why are you doing nothing to, God, you don't know what you're doing. And there is a deep truth in that question. God is not obligated to fulfill human expectations about who he is. Listen, times of confused faith will often reveal one of the weakest things about our faith. And that is, We can follow God just close enough to believe that if God exists, he exists to give me the life I want. Did you hear that? I'll believe in God just as long as I'm getting the things from God that I expect him to give me. And that simple faith will not sustain you through tough times. In fact, it'll destroy you. We need a faith that will cling to God as he really is, not as we would make him up to be. We need strong faith in confusing times. I, I often quote C.S. Lewis. I, I was getting through his book on pain uh, throughout the pandemic. It's like, you know, when you have a lot of time, that is a tough one to get through. Uh, and I, I noodled through a lot of these things. That, but he's got a, a thought in here I want to read to you because he actually dealt with suffering and pain. It actually had a lot to do with his coming closer to God. Um, the woman he loved was sick and he cared for her until she died. And he, he kind of worked through that process. And there had to be a lot of why God in those times. But he wrote about our desire for God to just fix everything, to make our lives what we want them to be. And this is how he says it. And of course, there's always a little bit of sarcasm in his writing. And so he says, by the goodness of God, we mean nowadays almost exclusively his lovingness. By love, in this context, most of us mean kindness, the desire to see others than the self happy. Not happy in this way or that, but just happy. What would really satisfy us would be a God who said, of anything we happen to like doing, what does it matter so long as they're contented? We want, in fact, not so much a father in heaven as a grandfather in heaven, a senile benevolence who, as they say, like to see young people enjoying themselves and whose plan for the universe was simply that it might be truly said at the end of each day, a good time was had by all. That is not a tough faith. So even when we are confused in our faith, we ought to remain clear about God. God does not exist to give us the life we demand of him. He lives to redeem our pain and our discomfort. He knows that suffering can strengthen our faith, purify our desires, and in the end, glorify his name. You know, one thing I've seen 
in people that seem to have unshakable faith is they are the very same people who have been rocked again and again in their faith. But they kept clinging to who they knew God to be. And that's the second part about a confused faith. You know, confused faith, as bad as it feels to be asking God why, it can handle a pretty heavy load. It can take it. In fact, it brings us to the understanding that it is absolutely right for us to be burdened with what's wrong. That God allows us to be shaken because he knows that can make us stronger. You know, if a simple faith was really enough, there's no need to struggle. But it is precisely when I struggled with my faith, when I was confused and burdened and asked God why, those were the times when God increased and strengthened my faith. In fact, the only way to avoid any struggle, any trial in this life is to just ignore it. In fact, I, I think about the little kids, like when you're, you're playing hide and seek and they don't quite know how to get behind something, and so they just close their eyes, then clearly you can't see them. I think a lot of times we play this game with God. You see, a confused faith will not hide from God. And we can do that, and we just look away, we pretend it doesn't exist, but even when we're confused, we ought to run toward God because a tougher faith will make you weep over what's wrong in this world. But it's better to cry out to God than to never cry at all. It's better to have a heart learning to be, be tough by, by calling on God and asking God uh, instead of a heart so tough because it can't feel it all by never looking at what's wrong around it. You see, a tough faith will always run towards God. It will never run away. And this is what Habakkuk did when he had issues with God. He asked why, and then he waited for an answer. And this, this is what makes this strengthening. He asked God why, and then notice what he said. He goes, I'm going to stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I'll look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give, uh, be given for this complaint. I, I love the fact that Habakkuk wholeheartedly believes that God is going to answer me. And I would encourage you today by saying, God doesn't run away from your tough questions. He welcomes, in fact, you've not come up with a tough question that's going to stump God. He wants you to reason with him and ask him. And there's an answer for you there. But in taking his confusion to God, Habakkuk starts exercising and working out his faith. And this is what we ought to do with God. We wrestle it out. Growing up, family of four kids, I can tell you right now, all of us, we had different tastes, different likes, different interests, but I could say looking back, the four of us loved almost more than anything wrestling dad. Isn't that interesting? And neither one of my sisters wrestled in high school. I don't know what the deal is. But we loved wrestling with dad. We never won. It was always at least four on one, if not three on one. He'd have one under this arm, one under this, you know. It always hurt and we always lost, but we always came back. There was something about wrestling that out. We loved it. And this is what our faith needs. We ought to say to God, I would rather wrestle with you than struggle through this life without you. I don't, I don't want to be in a world. I don't want to exist in a place where all I have is why and no one above it. And so we take it to God. And that's what these little notes were all about up here. It's about starting to bring difficult things in your life to God and working that out and asking those questions of God. And like Habakkuk, expecting an answer. God, God will help you here. And when you're confused about what God is doing, you know, sometimes all you can do is just really lean into what you know for sure about who God is. You see, even a confused faith knows that we hope in the character of God. I don't know why things are like they are. And I'm confused by why God, who is holy, somehow endures and allows so much evil in this world. Why is there so much divorce and pain in relationship? Why is there so much pain and suffering in this world, especially when you think of the little ones that endure it? Why, why did I lose that job? Why, why haven't I found another one? Why is there so much cruelty and violence in this world? Why so much injustice? Why am I so sick? Maybe you've been asking God why, like Habakkuk. And what you need is a strong faith for these confusing times. And 
What will really exercise your faith is trusting what you already know about God. And so ask why, and then sit back and trust. He is good. He is great. He is holy. And he loves you with his everlasting love. Listen, there will always be a little confusion in your faith. Because if you understood everything, why would you need any faith at all? It's just going to always be why that we deal with. In fact, it should start to be more settling to us that God so often leaves us unsettled in our faith. This is really, I think, what Isaiah was getting at. He says, my, my thoughts, God says, are not your thoughts, neither are your ways. My ways, declares the Lord, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. We need a God whose thoughts are above our own. We need a God whose holiness and ways are far above our own. If God is not in every way higher than us, how will he ever lift us up? And so it's okay to bring your confusion to this God. When we wonder why, we need to run to God and kneel. Because he can be trusted. I can't tell you in the past 15 months, How many times this simple wisdom verse was all I could cling to? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he'll make your path straight. You know, we forget that, and the confusion gets worse. So cling to who you know God is. I often do not know why, but I can always know who. In fact, the truth is we need to stop trying to view God through the chaos of why and remember to view the chaos of why through whom we know God is and that our God is able. I was thinking about this in this particular series. Um, This is written so long before Jesus, but there's so many references here to the way God wants to save And our Christian faith is unique. It's unique to any other religion in the world for many reasons. But I think perhaps the the greatest difference and uniqueness of Christianity to any other religion in the world is prophesied here in Isaiah 55. Speaking of Jesus, it says he was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one of whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Listen, Christianity is the only religion that is founded on a God who is willing to suffer for you. To take our place. Look, when I am seriously confused about why, I have to visit the cross. There God reminds me. There's no good reason for what Jesus had to go through except for the joy set before him. He endured the cross because he loved us. That's how we can develop a tough faith for tough times. Visit the cross. Take your why to God. And remember, God told Habakkuk, it is by their faith that the righteous shall live. And I would say throughout this month, I'm going to continue to pray. Then in the midst of all our confusion, God's going to build in us a strong faith. One tough enough to endure the toughest of times.